You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. There are a lot of topics that we could cover on this episode of Socks in the Basement. We could talk about Garrett Crochet and Luis Robert Jr. And how every national baseball writer already has them traded off of the team. How so many people assume they're going to be moved, even though you have three more years of Luis Robert Jr. and two more years of Garrett Crochet after this season. And you're trading them in the hopes you can get a prospect as good as Garrett Crochet or Luis Robert Jr. And I think we've covered it already. If the White Sox trade these guys, they're saying we don't think we could compete for three years because you are not going to be able to find a Luis Robert Jr. at $20 million a year two years from now if you go out on the open market to try to get that kind of player, especially the way that this owner spends. Another thing we could talk about are the guys that are probably going, definitely going, have to go. Guys that are not part of the long-term plan, like Paul DeYoung's going, Tommy Pham's going. If they get a prospect back that they like, somebody they scout or they know about, and it seems with this new regime, you don't hear the White Sox are sitting in the stands learning about players in the system thing anymore. Instead, it seems like they already have an idea of what everybody has in each system and what they would want for the players they have to trade. We could talk about the thing nobody's talking about, Andrew Vaughn and Gavin Sheets. There can only be one. You cannot justify having two replacement-level first basemen with one of them playing out of position anymore if you intend to be a serious baseball team. Vaughn got hot over the last couple of weeks. He had 250, though, over the last seven days, so he's reverting back to the norm. And I think everything, or most everything, was a single. Gavin Sheets, a guy that almost didn't make the team, then came out hot, has reverted back to what he is. And going into Tuesday night, they're both hitting 236. And they're dead on replacement level. That's a story. One of those guys has to go. You cannot have both on your team when you start next year. So it'd be interesting to see if they could move one of them. It'd be amazing if Aloy Jimenez could stay healthy long enough so he could be traded. It'd also be great to see you out at Cork and Carry at the Park, the official sponsor of Socks in the Basement, in the shadow of the ballpark, 33rd and Princeton. Incredible award-winning burgers, great ballpark favorites. They got the beers, the spirits, the wines, that incredible staff. You are never waiting. You are never worried about your order. You are never worried about making it into the ballpark on time. Bring the whole family, get them fed beforehand. And after the game, it's a party, win or lose. See everything they have going on at CorkandCarry.com. There's a lot of things you could talk about when it comes to the White Sox in this episode of Sox in the Basement. But I think the thing that struck me the most over the last couple of days is that Tony La Russa is running the team. Kind of kind of looking that way a little bit, isn't it? I, I've become convinced of it. Tony La Russa is the shadow government of the White Sox. Like, right. like the old man brought in his buddy. Wanted him to manage the team. He couldn't hack it. He was too old. He couldn't travel with the team. He had health problems. Fine. He gets better. He's installed as an advisor. Chris Getz is hired internally rather than go outside and get an actual general manager who might sit there and say, thanks, old man, for your advice, but I'm the GM. Instead, Chris Getz gets brought in. And I think Getz has done a lot of really smart things in terms of the people that he's brought in, the Brian Bannister hire, the Barfield hire. There's a lot of things that have been changed. I, I, I'm not saying that he's not doing anything in there. Like, he's not just a puppet or a figurehead. But I do think, based upon things that have come out over the last couple of days, that Chris Getz does not get to just make a decision, especially about his manager, without the blessing and input of Tony La Russa. And, and, you know, we talk about what should happen with this team, and then we talk about what is happening. So let's talk a little bit about what is happening. Bob Nightingale, and and he's so he's so interesting when he puts out his weekly thing, because he'll put out a story, and then he'll put tidbits, stuff that he's hearing. And if you ever look at Bob Nightingale's tidbits, for all the things about him that may annoy some White Sox fans, especially because he is a mouthpiece 
For somebody high up in the organization, my theory these days is it's Jerry, maybe even Tony pushing out Jerry's narrative, but he's getting it from that high up. And Bob has shown that over time and with, with all the little tidbits that he'll throw at the end of an article. He had a tidbit just the other day, and I'm going to read it in case you missed it. While Chicago White Sox manager Pedro Grafal's future is uncertain past this season, one name that is floating around internally as a potential replacement in 2025 is Skip Schumacher, manager of the Miami Marlins. So that tells me right there, based upon what Bob always seems to have in terms of the pulse and high, how high the pulse is in the White Sox organization, this is serious stuff and they're considering them. And I thought it was funny because James Fox was on this show And if it wasn't on the audio version, it was definitely on the YouTube version. And we talked about Skip as a likely candidate because of Tony La Russa. So the article goes on to say Schumacher, the reigning NL manager of the year, played seven years in St. Louis for Tony La Russa, who will be an integral part of the decision-making process. Now, that's the blurb. Right then and there, you go, okay, everything that, that James Fox mentioned Anything you may have assumed about Tony La Russa, it's all right there from a Bob Nightingale that no matter how annoying you may find him from time to time because of the stuff that he reports as a White Sox fan, is generally dead on when he has these tidbits. And so I get the picture, Tony La Russa has a major part to play in the front office. And then that was confirmed to me when Daryl Van Scown put out an article in the Sun-Times on the 24th of June talking about Tony La Russa's role as a White Sox special advisor. And I don't blame the author. The author has to ask these questions. In fact, it's a great thing to be able to get access to Tony and have this one-on-one conversation and find out what Tony thinks his role is. But when I read the quotes in this article, it really sounds like an old guy playing coy. It sounds like a guy who's like, oh, I let the, I'm just here to, to be an advisor and be around the team. I don't step on people's toes, but you can almost see the wink and the glint in his eye because he knows he holds a ton of sway because of his relationship with Jerry Reinsdorf. And I think La Russa is the shadow government in the White Sox front office. Well, it all makes sense. Like you said, Bob Nightingale is perched on high with the White Sox organization. I mean, he gets, he gets his information from the top pretty clearly because what he says generally has a grain of truth to it. And, and I'm sure Skip Schumacher, who, you know, the Marlins are having a bad year. Uh, he's probably on the hot seat down there. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that he's available for for the White Sox to snap him up. And I'm not necessarily against Skip Schumacher. I mean, sometimes these things I think get presented, and because of the negative feelings that we have as Sox fans about Tony La Russa based on what he did in the dugout the past couple of years, you know, in his return to her, and, you know, just the idea that he's Jerry's guy – doesn't necessarily mean that Skip Schumacher is a bad candidate to run a team. No, it's just the process that always gets me, Ed. The process is what gets me. Yeah, that's the problem, is, is that arriving at the right answer, but your work is wrong, is is a real thing, right? You, you, can, you can get lucky and you can guess the right answer in a math problem, but if you show your work and your work is off... You know, you're, you're not going to get full credit for it. And that's the same thing Sox fans give to the White Sox is, look, you might sign a free agent. You might make a trade that really does work out. But if it's in spite of yourself because your process is flawed, we don't believe you're going to be able to repeat it. And we don't believe that this was skill or talent as a general manager, as a front office. We believe that it was sheer luck. And with Tony, yeah, the guy's got some insight into baseball. However, he kind of like his boss, Jerry, there's aspects of their knowledge of Major League Baseball, not the game itself, but the the overarching organization, the league, okay, and the way the league runs. That's where they fall apart. And so for Tony to sit there and say, Skip Schumacher was, was one of my guys, okay, he was one of my utility infielders, and you know Tony La Russa loves him some utility infielders. So he has a great feel for Skip Schumacher as a baseball mind. There, I don't doubt that if I'm Chris Getz and and this is a this is a, a candidate that that has had some success and as a guy that that Tony La Russa says you know Tony La Russa's got a good mind for the game that Tony La Russa says this is a guy that can run a dugout this is a guy that can do this I think you have to take that if you're Chris Getz I mean there is something to be said about it but 
if all you're ever going to get is Tony LaRusa guys, and if all you're ever going to get are guys that are Jerry approved because Tony says so, you're going to run out of guys really, really quickly. And you do need to be able, if you're Chris Getz, to your point about the process, Chris Getz needs to be able to sit there and say, thank you, Mr. LaRusa. I appreciate your input, but I'm kind of liking the way the Dodgers do things. I want to read some of these quotes from the Sun-Times article. Before I do that, Socks in the Basement listeners, switch to a new age of life. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, out of assisted living. Maybe you're getting older. You're trying to figure out how to get around the house. You're afraid that you might hurt yourself. You're living alone. It's all about getting around on your own, living independently, stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, even bathroom remodeling, all at Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. They work with your insurance and have 0% financing for qualified individuals. And Hyatt also has the latest and greatest in CPAP machines. If you're unhappy with your vendor, switch now. Get supplies directly mailed to you. And if you're down on the south side, stop by the showroom. They have testing rooms and they'll show you all your options you probably don't even know about. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors and any medical equipment you can probably think of. See everything High at Home Medical Equipment has to offer at hhme.com. And I'll just take the quotes, things straight from Tony's mouth. My job description is absolutely zero in common with the uh, president, vice president of the team. I'm a special advisor, which means I can advise throughout the organization. I evaluate talent. I'm not a scout. He tries to paint a picture that it's totally advisory. In fact, he says it right here. It's totally advisory. Quote, you have opinions, but you don't go out there pushing them on anyone. That's not an advisor role. I don't have an agenda. I haven't had a thought about interfering. Very simply, build relationships so people in the organization know they can trust me. If this article doesn't come out a couple days after the Nightingale thing, I probably take it at face value. When it comes out a couple days after the Nightingale thing, it feels like a, a, a reporter did it, did his job and said, I want to talk to Tony about what he really does, right? So the, the reporter's doing his job, but he was granted access and the answers were given to dispute something that the Nightingale blurb basically put out there and painted a picture of, which is one of Tony's guys is probably going to be hired because Tony has a lot of sway inside the front office. So now you have to come out and combat that. It's what they've been doing all year long. It's the way they've been doing things for decades, but you've seen this. We've talked about this. The PR machine that is the Chicago White Sox. I constantly call them a community baseball organization and happens to be in Major League Baseball that is truly just a public relations machine built around a billionaire to protect his legacy and further it. That's what the White Sox are, unfortunately. At least the Jerry Reinsdorf White Sox. One day when he's dead, you would expect that to be different. But right now, that's what they are. And so I found it interesting that this article comes out just a couple of days after the little Nightingale blurb when there's so much smoke around who's really making the decision about the manager and why haven't we fired the most inept and worst manager in White Sox modern history in my lifetime. And I'm 47 years old and I worse than Boom Boom Bevington. Sorry, Boom Boom was dumb. But he wasn't as dumb as Pedro. Well, it, and, yeah. and the guy is holding on with his job, and we're wondering who they're, what they're going to do. The only good news I take out of the entire thing this week is that Pedro's gone at the end of the year. That they stubbornly are going to wait until there's one year left on his deal because that's a Jerry Reinsdorf policy that he's only going to pay a guy for one year to sit on his couch. So we have to put up with him this year. But I know he's going to be replaced. That's the only good news that put a smile on my face when I looked at what came out this week from the organization. Yeah, well, and, and again, you, you know, you take the pluses and the minuses. Now, one of the things that we're going through as White Sox fans, I think if you look across a lot of major sports, when you get an owner who is old and who has been around the game a long time or has been in the ownership chair a long time, maybe maybe not around the game, there's aspects of it that, that you know, you feel like the modern game has passed them by. And in Tony LaRusse's case, one of the things that I think we saw with him in the dugout was a little bit of him not having enough energy really to command a room anymore. Uh, the, the legend of Tony LaRusso only went so far in terms of keeping the players and keeping their attention. So that there was there was some of that was just his age, his his general health, and you know the, the rigors of being out on the road. And I think when when Tony was here, you and I talked a lot about that about how that's just that's just life, man. It's not even a bad reflection on Tony, but. 
there were aspects of, of the way that he approached things that you could kind of tell were rooted in his heyday, which his heyday was a long time ago at this point, right? He had not been a manager for a very long time and hadn't been a very successful manager, you know, for, for a little while as well. And Jerry's kind of the same way. He bought the team in 1980, and he's he's looking at things from the, from a similar prism, you feel like, to the way he looked at things in the 80s and the 90s and not even really this century. So when Tony La Russa is making a pick, again, as White Sox fans, we have to be leery of why are we not getting rid of Pedro now? Why are we waiting? Why does it matter? What's Who cares about the money, you billionaire who owns this team, just just get rid of this guy. We're waiting for a manager to leave his contract that everybody it's already kind of known is not going to be with the Marlins next year that they already have identified as this is the guy we should bring in. I'm sure Getz gets some input, but this goes back to how we've always seen this team being run, right? Han and 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 Kenny would get into a room with Jerry and there'd be a consortium because there was never one guy who made a decision. And we're right back to that, aren't we? We're back to Getz having a having a plan, but Tony comes in and says, I don't know. I mean, my advice would be this. And Jerry going, I don't know. I mean, he is Tony La Russa. I mean, I made a mistake by getting rid of him back in the 80s. And then look at all he did. And I always said it was my greatest regret. So, I mean, I kind of have to listen to him. I've been it hasn't steered us uh steered us off a cliff so far, has it? Oh, wait, it has. Well, I, I'm still sticking with him. Like, I mean, like, that's that's what's going on in there. And, it, you know, it's, like, that's the thing. Like, there are times where I get aggravated with the way things are working, and I don't know exactly, right? I can only use just reason, logic, reading between the lines, reading what's actually written in the lines to understand yeah, what's going on with this team. sometimes the, the lines do help. Right, exactly. But, but I mean, like, I, I, I sometimes feel pity for Chris Getz. I see a guy who worked in a terrible regime, and and then had to kind of bite his tongue and then got an opportunity because he talked the guy who was in charge into letting him be the GM. But he isn't I don't know if he's really completely in control of the team. He clearly can't get rid of his manager. It's obvious the way he disappeared for so much time and he didn't want to talk about Pedro. And then when he finally was basically it seemed to me he looked like a hostage. Suddenly he had to go sit in front of the press and he wouldn't say anything that showed real support for his manager. But you could tell, I mean, like, I feel like this guy wants to get rid of him and he can't. And I wonder if he's going to have a real say in who's going to be the next manager or if it's going to be, well, Tony thinks this is the guy and you're new kid and you're doing a great job. But I think Tony's got a good idea you should listen to. And that's what it feels like. And I don't even know if that's a bad thing, right? Because Schumacher's not the worst manager out there. He wouldn't be bad for the team. If you, you know, if you have structure around and he's just deciding like, I'm going to play this guy and maybe he's strong enough to look at a guy who's making 75 million over five years and say, you're only hitting 200 or lower big guy. Andrew, you're down at the bottom of the order or you're sitting next to me and maybe you need that guy. Maybe that's the kind of manager he is. I have no idea. All right. But so I, I can't, I can't judge that. It's the process that concerns me. And so again, I'm, I'm happy Pedro's leaving. Seems really obvious now he's leaving, I just I just don't know who's really in charge of the manager search and is it going to be the right guy because it really does feel like the whole thing that happened a couple of years ago when it should have been AJ Hinch and then Jerry got the idea to bring back his buddy Tony. And so where I think you're going to see that is we know what Chris Getz's philosophy is towards team building, right? We know that he wants to, at least this is what he publicly stated, he wants a team that's going to be fundamentally sound, a team that is going to catch the ball, a team that is going to not shoot themselves in the foot, right? Pitching and defense wins championships, so to speak. But if the team starts getting built around the idea of the three-run homer, okay, and starts getting built around the idea of you know, the way that we talked about when Tony was here, how he wanted to try and recreate the Oakland A's, the La Russa Oakland A's or the La Russa Cardinals, where – you do want thumpers in the middle of the lineup and base stealing is just for the leadoff hitter and maybe the ninth place hitter. And there's not a whole lot of thought given to in, in the major, the current major league game. When you have guys that can hit home runs, sometimes those guys are really poor defensively, right? And, and so if you've got a team of Jose Canseco's, if you want to go back to that, where Jose Canseco is the guy, if you look it up, he's the guy who's playing right field for the Texas Rangers when he allowed a home run to go off of his forehead and go over the fence. That should give you all you need to know about Jose Canseco's defense in the outfield. So if you're willing to make those compromises, as Chris gets all of a sudden, when you said, this is going to be a fundamentally sound team, we're not going to drop the ball. 
We're going to catch the ball. We're not going to shoot ourselves in the foot. We're going to play good, sound baseball as a baseline, as a floor, no matter who's on the team. And all of a sudden, it's it's compromised to that degree where you have Gavin Sheets in right field because you're willing to, to sacrifice the defense for the offense over and over again. Then you know that the influence is real in that regard and where Chris Getz is completely neutered. Because I think one of the things that, that I would have a question about Skip Schumacher, again, he's had some success. He is an established major league manager. If he's got a good baseball brain, if he's able to command a room, these are all things that Pedro Griffol lacks. And so that's why we need to get rid of him. And he's never shown that he has them. So if Skip Schumacher is going to be at least a neutral manager, my question is, is Skip Schumacher a guy that is going to preach fundamentals? Is he a guy that's going to help teach young guys fundamentals and continue to reinforce those things? Is he going to bench guys for making physical errors and mental errors in the field? Is he going to be a guy that does the things that Chris Getz told us the White Sox will do? This will be the White Sox way. Or is Skip Schumacher a guy that is struggling right now in Miami? Because unlike last year when Jake Berger was hot and bailing him out, at the end of games after he got traded there or when he had talent that was, was on the field and was staying on the field and was doing well. And the Marlins have been a mess this year. They, they even traded one of their best hitters already is, you know, is he a guy that's going to rely on the talent on the field? Because that was not what Chris gets wanted necessarily. And I think that's where Chris gets not being able to fire Pedro has stuck in his craw because one of the problems that we've had with the 2024 white Sox is that, Even though on paper a bunch of their players are good defensively, they have been mentally and physically out of the game over and over again. Let's talk about a guy who's uh, who's out of the game physically. Aloy Jimenez. You see him run. You see Aloy trying to run around the bases. See that? See that? He can't do it. You see that? You see him running around the bases, and and he can't even can't even get around the bases. He, He this guy's done. I know he drove in a couple of runs in the first inning on Tuesday night. But he's made out of glass or maybe sand. Every time he runs, you just expect him to fall down or break down or whatever. And and I, I'm going to tell you right now, you, you get to the trade deadline and it's it's over and there's nothing you can do with him and you know you're going to buy him out. DFA him. If, if he can't get better, DFA him. Eloy Jimenez is over. Like right now, the only way that Eloy Jimenez gives you any reason to keep him in the lineup is if he magically heals and goes on a tear for three weeks and you can convince some team to give you a bag of balls for him and and, and essentially just take over the buyout, right? We'll give you Eloy for cash considerations to pay the $3 million we're going to pay at the end of the year to buy him out. That's what you would want or what something like that. Like, you don't, you're not even getting a player for this guy at this point. Here's, here's how bad it is. You know what a lawyer would be good for, for on the trade market. If you were willing to take a chance on a guy with a bad contract who you think could help this team. Yeah, but you don't want to do that because you, you have to free up as much space as possible. And it gives, oh, it gives oh, I know, the, I know. So I mean, you, you gave it, but that you know, would be it. He's $3 million being bought out and he takes up room on your roster and in your lineup that should be given to some of the younger players that you would rather give playing time to in the second half of the season. Okay. It didn't work out. There's a time and a place to, to just finally understand that certain guys didn't work out like late in the season. If you get to the trade deadline and Brian Ramos is playing really well down there. And you don't have room for Yoan Moncada if you bring him up, but it's time to get him back up here and give him another go at it. Then you do the same thing with Yoan because you're buying him out as well. You're not paying him $25 million next year to be on this team. So that'll be that'll be the most interesting thing, right? It's not about wins and losses at this point. It's about building for the future. And these guys are not part of it. And I, you watch you watch Aloy struggle going around the base baths, and you you have to realize at this point it will never work out. And I, I have a friend of mine who gave me a really a really interesting theory as to why we see these soft tissue injuries. Because he works with people who have soft tissue injuries, and he said the problem is, and you see it a lot with ball players, guys that stick around an organization year round are being taught to work on certain stretches and soft tissue exercises so that they're limber and they play the game. Because baseball is not about how big you are. It's about your your physicality, how limber you are, how stretched out you are, right? 
And then the problem yeah, you, is you want to be wiry. Right. You want to be you want to be limber. You want to be you, you can't be stiff. You can't be stiff. And he said you can't be stiff. And the thing I always see is the Instagram pictures of these guys that leave the team, may go back to their home country or go work out some other part of the country, but they're away from the team facilities and they're always lifting. They're always lifting. They're always showing off their six pack. They're all showing off their strength and things like that. And that is not what you're supposed to be. And when he said that to me, I looked at who gets the soft tissue injuries and I'm like, well, these are guys that are not around the team for four or five months in the off season. And some of them are the guys that I always see working in the gym and everybody's like, oh, they look swole, but that's not what they're supposed to be. It didn't work out with this guy. He didn't have the discipline, in my opinion, to, to take care of a baseball body. Right. And it, because a lot of that work has to go in in the offseason, and he wasn't around the team. He didn't spend year round at team facilities or within reach of the team, at least as far as I can tell. And if he was, then somebody within the team failed him in terms of making sure he had a baseball body. But some of these guys just aren't going to work out, and you got to move on from them, Ed. The, the team failed him, and the team failed these guys who get these soft injury injuries, especially if it's if it's related to their offseason regimen. The team fails him because you want to go home to your home country. You want to go home to Arizona. You want to go home to somewhere that's not, you know, Chicago. Well, then send somebody with him, right? If you're going to invest right. 15, 20 million dollars into a guy a year, oh in, God, invest, yes. invest like, you know, $40,000 to send a trainer down to his place for the next six months to keep him on track. How much does a personal trainer cost? Get him a personal trainer. <laughs> right. Yeah, get some, make get, get his, some make his a, regimen. Get some guy a hotel or a house that you rent down there, and he's White Sox staff or White Sox approved, who goes with your $15 million guy, and you pay him, what, 50 k for six months of work to go sit down there and take care of him? Yes, yes, just go do that. Go get this guy. You know, it, it, go get Aloy Jimenez. Go get Luis Robert Jr. Go get whoever. I don't care who it is. Just, just everybody who's not going to be at a team facility, if you're not going to go and work out at the team facility in Arizona, then fine. You know, if you're in California, if you're in Florida, wherever the heck you're, you're going to be, if you're out of the country, but the White Sox should be able to afford to send members of their training staff out to help these guys and follow a regimen and make sure that they're protected on a baseball body. And like you said, if they are doing that, and these injuries keep happening to the same guys year after year after year, then you need to change the training staff because they're not being effective. That's not something where I can sit there and say, I know what I'm doing and they don't. No, it's not even that. I just, I've just, i just watched Aloy Jimenez during his entire White Sox career suffer injury after injury after injury, and some of them, like when he jumped to catch that home run that he had no chance of catching and ripped his pack, stuff like that is... Aloy Jimenez not being smart with his body. Right. But then him limping around the base pass after he just got done with a hamstring injury, that's either the team's training staff or that's Aloy, one of the two. You know, him not following along with what it is. And either way, it doesn't matter. And think about it, Ed. This is the same thing. This is the same argument that I have when, let's say, Justin Timberlake gets pulled over, DUI, and he's worth millions upon millions of dollars. And you go, use an Uber, big guy. You can't hire a driver. Right. You cheaped out there. Like, that's where you don't yeah, cheap out, right? Like, when you get a pro athlete who makes $10, $20 million a year and he gets pulled over for DUI or, God forbid, is in an accident and kills somebody or paralyzes them and his whole life is over and you're like, oh, hold on, a bit. you, you could have Ubered. You could probably hire a guy to drive you around. People make less money than you and they make that decision. What are you doing? It's the same thing with the White Sox. Look at the money and time and effort you invested and it seems like you couldn't just spend that little bit extra to make sure that you're keeping track of these guys and that you were working on those specific things. That's how I'll always view this time period in White Sox history. Right. Is you you know, you and, and it goes back to the the root cause of all problems. The root cause of all problems is Jerry Reinsdorf and the idea that you had people who had an idea, whether they were right or wrong, whether or not they saw it all the way through, but somewhere along the line, there's always a disconnect between the person who should be the central decision maker. And then the guy who's spending the money and somehow just a little bit doesn't get spent or they miss on something that was, they were right there, it was there for the taking, it was the next logical move and too many cooks get into the kitchen or the old man cheaps out. And then we're right back to what we started with. Tony La Russa, reportedly with influence over a manager when it should be Chris gets his guy because he's the, he's the new GM and he's trying to craft something. It's the White Sox way, Ed. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks 
Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found. And always on SocksInTheBasement.com.